All right, cool. Um, thanks for coming out, guys. Uh, so this is a beginner level talk uh, on how to tune your RabbitMQ at a large scale cloud. Um, so this is just kind of an overview of some of the lessons we've learned uh, deploying OpenStack uh, at Huawei. So in this talk, we're, I'm going to focus mainly on highlighting some of the challenges we had uh, deploying RabbitMQ. Um, and also kind of show the performance changes that can happen when you deploy uh, RabbitMQ in different uh, deployment models. And lastly, I'm just going to highlight some uh, techniques we use at Huawei to kind of monitor, uh, monitor and kind of debug the, our RabbitMQ environment. So this is actually not me. Um, <laughs> my name is Gordon Chung. Uh, I'm a developer at Huawei uh, in Canada. I primarily work on uh, OpenStack upstream development. I focus on Oslo and uh, telemetry projects. So I'm actually standing in for Wang, who is actually a software engineer at, our, at, at Huawei as well in Hangzhou. Uh, so he operates um, the OpenStack cloud for us. Uh, he has about three years experience. Um, myself, I've been working on OpenStack upstream for, since 2012. Cool. Um, so just a basic overview of RabbitMQ. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's pretty much like the foundation for everything in OpenStack. It's how all the services communicate with each other, um, whether it's kind of launching an instance or handling metering. Um, all the messages and all the communication mo mainly goes through RabbitMQ for the most part. Um, there are other options, but I think generally in, in deployment, most people are using RabbitMQ. Um, so it's a messaging service. Um, it's a broker-based messaging service, so if you're not sure what that is, um, basically when you send a message, it actually goes to a broker first, and that kind of, that broker service dictates where the message will end up going, or who the receiver will, who actually receives that message. Um, to interact with RabbitMQ, we use all the messaging in OpenStack. Most of the projects in OpenStack use all the messaging. There are a few exceptions, like Swift. Um, but it basically provides a kind of generic API to handle uh, message communication between project, projects. And it allows us to connect to not just RabbitMQ, but if you should choose, there's also different uh, drivers, such as ZeroMQ and Kafka. Um, but Rabbit, RabbitMQ is definitely the best supported uh, driver out there right now. Um, but there is a lot of work being done to uh, make zero MQ and Kafka viable alternatives. But yeah, again, um, for us at, at Huawei and our Fusion Sphere, Fusion Sphere project, our product, we use uh, RabbitMQ, and this talk will kind of highlight most of, or will just highlight just RabbitMQ. Cool. Um, so the main topics we'll t I'm going to highlight today regarding problems is uh, regard revolve around performance and reliability. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, when there's different deployment models you can kind of leverage when deploying RabbitMQ, um, and it kind of depends on what your system is built like. Um, but in general, when you deploy OpenStack, the more services you use, um, er everything kind of increases exponentially from that. Um, so when you have more services, you have more messages, and when you have more messages, there's just a lot of pressure being put on in RabbitMQ. And often when deploying OpenStack, RabbitMQ becomes kind of a failure point when, um, well, one of the first failure points that a lot of people run into. So f regarding performance issues, a lot of them, I think, a lot of people will run, in, will run into issues with memory. Um, so RabbitMQ, you can choose to store your messages into memory or disk. Um, generally, people use memory. And as you scale up your cloud environment, your memory uh, requirements will also need to scale up with that. Um, so, when you're, so say if you're booting like 1,000 instances at once, you're going to have a lot of messages, not just between Nova uh, 
uh, services, but also just messages between Nova and Neutron, Nova and Glance, and just secondary messages that you're not, you're probably not aware of. And as memory consumption or memory uh, or messages kind of increase in your system, the memory con your message consumption has to kind of scale up with that. And if it doesn't, things degrade ra rather quickly. Um, so if your queue actually gets larger and larger, the larger your queue is, the slower RabbitMQ will actually process your data. So it just kind of explodes really quickly if things start failing. Um, so that's one of the things that I think a lot of people need to be aware of. And just because RabbitMQ is such a critical part of OpenStack infrastructure, if it goes down, pretty much your entire cloud will go down because nothing can communicate with each other. So I think generally when people start out with uh, RabbitMQ and just deploying OpenStack in general, they'll start off with a single uh, RabbitMQ cluster. Um, so basically the, you'll have all your OpenStack services kind of communicating through one cluster. Uh, and if you think about it, when you're, when you're kind of deploying your OpenStack, you'll have hundreds of compute uh, services, hundreds of uh, slobber agents metering those compute, uh, compute services, um, and also hundreds of Neutron kind of agents working to deploy all like the requirements for your, your instance. And it can get pretty overwhelming, um, especially when you kind of scale up uh, your cloud. So uh, when you have hundreds of services running through your message queue, you'll actually have hundreds of thousands of messages actually p being passed through your message queue. And they use different uh, mechanisms. Um, some are topic-based, uh, some are fan out based I'll go into a little bit of that, of that a, a little later on. Um, but yeah, there, as you can see, it's like, there's obviously a single kind of point of failure there that will kind of uh, impact your system if it goes down. Um, so in addition to that, you actually, everything going through one service kind of creates a lot of uh, noisy neighbors where maybe your Nova uh, messages are probably more critical in deploying your instance whereas your Slometer data might not be as critical, but all that messages, all the messages that Slometer has will impact the performance of your Nova messages as well. So the, when we first deployed uh, RabbitMQ, I think a lot of people start off with that, and eventually they move to kind of a federated model. Um, so basically you kind of localize all your messages to specific uh, clusters. So this kind of eliminates your noise neighbor scenario where Slometer will be generating millions of messages at a time where that will actually inf impact your performance in Nova. But if you separate your clusters and actually have two log like sec separate uh, logical brokers, the messages in Slometer actually won't impact um, your messages in Nova as much, especially if they are, are on different hosts. So yeah, in this scenario, we kind of co-located co everything to their respective uh, functionality. Um, so Slammer is, a lot of the services are co-located to kind of the same, uh, not necessarily the same host, but in the same uh, cluster. And similarly, for, we do the same thing for Nova and Neutron. And, uh, and depending on how kind of chatty your systems are, you can kind of collocate your Cinder and Glance and, uh, services either shared with another uh, message, with, an, uh, with one of the other services, or if they're really high demanding, then you can probably separate them as well. So just like to test kind of differences in performance between the two, uh, designs that I showed. Uh, we did some very, very basic uh, testing. We basically just uh, set, like captured the time, the time stamp uh, 
of a message that before it was sent onto the queue from the publisher, and we captured that same timestamp on the consumer end, and we kind of just did the diff between the two. Um, so basically, we just synchronized uh, the time the the time on all our servers when we tested this, um, and yeah. Uh, so when we're testing Neutron, it's, it has a pretty unique scenario where you have a small set of uh, publishers or senders, and the way it works is it'll fan out that same message to multiple uh, consumers. So you end up having a, a very few senders and a lot of receivers. So in, the, in our test scenario, basically we set up uh, three senders and 500 uh, receivers, and we sent 1,000 messages across them. And each uh, message averaged to about one kilobyte per message. message. Um, uh, so testing for Nova, we did something. It, most of the calls in Nova function a little bit differently, so they use topic-based uh, publishing. So you basically have Almost so, like uh, you have a lot, you, it's kind of inverse. You have like a lot of producers and very few consumers. Um, so we did the, kind of the same thing, but reverse for Nova. We uh, set up 500 publishers just to send out uh, 20 messages each. And we set up, we created uh, three consumers to listen to all those messages. And we created, the, the message sizes were also at one kilobyte. And lastly, testing for Slometer. This one's also kind of different. Um, so Slometer actually scales horizontally, but just tested with uh, one publisher uh, sending all the, all the messages. And we created three consumers. Um, so the messages will end up being kind of split between all the consumers in a greedy fashion. So the consumer will just grab messages as, as they come along. Um, you'll notice that the message size here is, a, is one meg, which is pretty big compared to the other messages. I'll kind of explain why that is a little bit later on. Um, I should also mention that the way we tested this is we used RPC. Um, so RPC, if you're not familiar with it is uh, remote procedural calls. So basically you send a request and you expect a response back. Because of that workflow design, you essentially need two queues where one queue handles your request and one queue handles your response and your sender and uh, consumers need to register to both queues. Um, that's actually not required for Salamra's model. Salamra's workflow model is kind of a one-way stream. Um, and we actually don't recommend using RPC in Salometer. Uh, there's a work queue publisher that is suggested. But just for the sake of testing, we tested RPC here as well, uh, because Nova, that's what Nova and Neutron uses for their workflow. Um, so for our testing environment, we used OpenStack Juno, which our product, our most recent product is based on. So there's a few customizations there. But in general, it's OpenStack Juno. Uh, we use RabbitMQ 3.56. It's not the latest, um, but it's close enough. Uh, and there's also, we, use, we also use the Allison Messaging 1.51. Um, that's also pretty old, but it's relative to Juno. Um, and so for our test environment, we actually use five servers, and each server had 24 CPUs. 128 gigs of RAM, and they're all connected via one gig network. So yeah, so just keep in mind, a lot of these uh, results are based on Juno's, uh, Juno's code, so there probably are quite a bit of optimization since then. So based on results, this is what, is what, what happened uh, with when you had one single uh, RabbitMQ cluster. Uh, you can see that in general, Neutron and Salometer, they kind of uh, 
had the same relative performance. Uh, on average, took uh, like 50 milliseconds. And there are certain anomalies that took seven seconds in Slometer. Um, but Nova had a bit more uh, drastic uh, results based on our testing, um, where in some cases it took 30 seconds plus. Uh, we're actually not sure why that happened. Um, so I don't really have a, an answer for that for you guys. Uh, but it's possible that maybe Nova kind of misread a certain message, and because of that, it gets requeued into their into the same queue, and then ends up having having to process the entire queue again with that same message at the back. Um, so in this graph, there, the y-axis is actually the time between uh, us sending the message and receiving it, and the x-axis is a uh, the message ID, so each individual message. So yeah, um, so we also tested the same thing uh, using multiple clusters. Uh, as you can see, the performance was a lot more consistent. We didn't have crazy spikes randomly across the board. Um, and when it did spike, it, was, it wasn't a 30 second spike, it was a few millisecond spike. So you can, if you notice, uh, Slumber and Neutron kind of perform relatively the same, maybe a little bit faster, but Nova did experience a significant boost there. So this is just a comparison between kind of the results from a single clustered RabbitMQ versus the three cluster RabbitMQ that we had in solution. Um, you'll notice like the percentage of an, the performance increase for the max uh, kind of spiked heavily because of the random spikes we saw in Nova. But generally across the board, we saw a good consistent uh, increase in performance across all the services. And we had consistent behavior in uh, Nova. So, as I mentioned before, uh, the message size that we were using for Slammer was one meg, which was considerably larger than what we what the the message size we used for Nova and Neutron was. And the main reason for that is that when you use Slometer in a large scale environment, you'll have tens, of, maybe thousands of nodes, and on those nodes you have hundreds of machines, which ends up which ends up being tens of thousands of virtual machines. And then you have hundreds of thousands of ports for those virtual machines, and you have thousands of volumes and just kind of uh, spirals based on that. Um, so you, Slammer handles a lot of data, and it actually Slammer has this mechanism to minima, to aggregate samples together. So you instead of having millions of sample of messages, you can have uh, you can, instead of having millions of individual messages, you can have hundreds of messages with hundreds of samples in those messages. So you can kind of decide whether you want more messages with smaller payloads or bigger payloads with and less messages. Um, but if you did end up kind of grouping all your messages, all your samples in one message, the message size can grow sub substantially. Um, in, any, in a lot of large-scale environments, it can go over to one gig of data on your message queue, which is pretty large. So what we did was we played around with how we aggregated our data um, to kind of figure out what the optimal number was for uh, how many messages, how, how many samples should be in a message. And so we monitored, the, in this test, we kind of mo monitored the memory that RabbitMQ used when processing messages with 500 samples in it, uh, 5,000 and 50,000 samples in it. Um, obviously, each of those messages kind of grows in size. So if you have a 500 sample message, 
it's about a, a meg, um, and it kind of goes up 10 times each time. So based on that, uh, the results we found was that if you create a message size, a message that has 50,000 samples in it, which was roughly about five or 100 megs, the performance actually dramatically, de or it, neg it negatively affects your uh, system pretty hard. Uh, so on the y-axis, you can see the memory usage um, required by RabbitMQ. And it kind of spikes when you have a payload that's quite large. Um, whereas when we had sample sizes or messages with samples of 505,000, they kind of performed at relatively the same uh, performance. So yeah, uh, based on that, or based on our environment, it seemed like uh, 5,000 was a viable solution to kind of aggregate all your samples on. Um, it's definitely something you'll probably want to play with. So in addition to just performance, uh, RabbitMQ is a lot to, there's a lot of techniques to kind of monitor your status of uh, RabbitMQ to make sure it's performing at its kind of optimal uh, state. Um, generally people just, I think there was a talk earlier today about how to kind of manage your RabbitMQ. So this might be highlighting some of the same tools, uh, some of the same techniques. Um, but I think generally people just use uh, RabbitMQ as this command line interface where you can kind of query it by typing in RabbitMQ CTL uh, status and it'll give you kind of a general overview of how your system's performing. You can also type in other commands to kind of uh, get an idea of the state of the, the host that, of your your RabbitMQ is working on. Um, but yeah, some of the stuff that we kind of run into uh, when monitoring our RabbitMQ is that sometimes we'll just, we'll try to monitor it and by typing in, checking the status and that won't work. It'll just kind of time out. Uh, sometimes a queue will just die. Um, other times the consumer will kind of die and the queue will end up growing and then the queue will die. So a lot of things can end up going uh, pretty bad. Um, so cluster partitioning as well. So when you have your uh, Erlang no or RabbitMQ nodes for a single cluster, if they're partitioned uh, across different network domains, you might have issues there kind of with communication between your cluster. Um, but yeah, in general, some techniques to kind of improve the reliability of uh, RabbitMQ is to enable clustering. Um, so clustering kind of allows you to deploy multiple uh, RabbitMQ nodes, whether it be, it might be on the same host or it might be separated on different hosts. Different hosts. Um, but basically it'll create a single logical broker where all your messages will kind of be divided, kind of load balance across your uh, your single logical broker, and as you scale your environment up, you can add more uh, RabbitMQ nodes to your cluster to kind of spread that load out to handle the messages that, or the increase in messages that you'll receive. Um, it also gives you fault tolerance. Um, if one RabbitMQ node goes down, the other ones can kind of pick up the slack for it. Uh, for that one node going down. Uh, so, so some other additional techniques we use to monitor RabbitMQ is to check the status of the nodes themselves. Um, so you can run RabbitMQ CTL eval and type in is running and I'll give you uh, some information on the spe specific node. Um, so also if you, we also check uh, the state, the health of our, each of the nodes in the cluster. And if there's a node that's uh, performing poorly, we'll uh, kind of restart it. We'll shut it down and restart it. Um, 
Um, so yeah, there's also, uh, if say a consumer goes down, you'll notice that your queues will actually start growing at quite a large rate sometimes, uh, specifically if it's a salometer, which deals with a lot of uh, information constantly. Um, tomorrow that there's the same, using the same uh, command line interface, you can check the size of your queues to make sure they're all like relatively low. Um, again, as I mentioned, if you let your queues grow really large, it oftentimes RabbitMQ will not be able to kind of uh, revive itself from that because uh, it just can't deal with large queues as well as small queues. And also just, we added a, a lot of uh, additional uh, logging for our consumers. So if something does go wrong uh, on the receiver's end and it doesn't kind of process the meshes properly, we'll get logs and then we can check those logs to make sure whether um, we need to make changes to the environment to handle them. Uh, also, yeah, in, in addition to like the command line interface that RabbitMQ has, we also use Zabbix. Um, so we'll check the state or the status of the server itself. Uh, so we'll collect metrics like memory usage and CPU usage, disk usage, IO state, and depending, and based on those numbers, we'll kind of be able to guess or how to, to handle the current load that we're, we're, that we're experiencing. So if the disk usage is, uh, or if the CPU usage is, uh, is spiking, we can maybe consider adding uh, another node to kind of distribute the load a bit better. Um, or maybe if the RAM memory usage is high, we can increase the memory there. Um, so it's definitely something that you'll have to track kind of as you deploy your, uh, your cloud and it will change uh, over, like day to day. So it's something to just keep an eye on. Um, in addition to that, there's also a management plugin for RabbitMQ. Um, which actually provides a lot of information that the CLI has, um, but it gives you information in a nice, fancy uh, visual. Um, so it's a lot more easier to consume if you don't like CLIs. Uh, I'll give you graphs to kind of give you a historical, uh, a historical overview of like your past performance, and you can also scale your RabbitMQ based on those numbers. Uh, cool. Um, so right now, for our clouds, a lot of them are around 600 plus compute or nodes. Um, obviously, a lot, everyone wants to scale to a larger um, OpenStack cloud. Some dream of 10,000 nodes. I don't know if that's possible. Um, but everyone wants to go bigger and bigger and bigger. And as that increases, Rabin, the requirements of RabbitMQ are gonna, definitely going to have to increase and kind of improve along with it. Um, we don't really have, I asked the original uh, author of this uh, talk to, to, if he has any uh, recommendations or what needs to be done in RabbitMQ. And I, I don't think we really have any suggestions on what needs to be improved in RabbitMQ. I think RabbitMQ will improve over time just as OpenStack will improve over time. And um, yeah, it's just it's a lot of uh, monitoring and just tweaking of your environment, just keeping constant uh, checks on how your systems, how your RabbitMQ systems are handling your current node, and kind of taking that information and adjusting it to kind of your future plans and where your cloud wants to be. Yeah, that's uh, the presentation. Um, if you have questions, I was told that you should go to the mics. I might not have the answer, I should add that disclaimer. Uh, but maybe someone else here has an answer or I can kind of follow up on that. I have, I guess I have two. Sure. Um, the first one is, since you guys are running Juno, how did you guys deal with multiple RabbitMQ MQ instances and heartbeats problem, the heartbeat problems? 
Did you? Um, so I, I don't know the specifics of what we've backported. Um, there is like heartbeat support now. Um, and I, I know a lot of distros and a lot of products will tend to backport certain features. Um, so that, I, I don't want to speak, like I don't want to assume that we backport that feature, but it might be backported. Okay, and then the second one is about your kind of federated model that you have. Yeah. So when you separated those type of things and for example, Nova on the compute has to wait for Neutron to respond back that a port has been created and yeah. you only have one entry in the Nova or Neutron configs to tell you to go where it's RabbitMQ is, yeah. how is it gonna know how to get to the Neutron version? Um, so it can get the message and create the port. Uh, so I'm not sure how Nova would handle that, but in I was mentioning you can define multiple targets to listen to and like cons either send to multiple uh, clusters or or you can connect to different clusters if you're also messaging. Okay. Yeah. So my question is uh, kind of twofold. Uh, number one, when did you start seeing latency issues? Uh, and number two, how many instances did you have? You see licensing issues? Uh, when did you start seeing latency issues? Latencies, oh. Yeah. Um, so, had, yeah, we just. your environment? Yeah, so this test environment was, I don't know how, when we experienced it in our real production environment, um, but I think based on our numbers, it was like, we were seeing a thousand messages per, like at, at any given time. And yeah, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that question. All right, thanks. Yeah, no problem. Hey, uh, so with the federated model, uh, did you see any spikes in the memory? Did, uh, did I see any? The, yeah, spikes in the RabbitMQ memory. Spikes? Yeah. Um, not in our test environment. Uh, it's, it's what we use in our product right now. And I don't know from like a day-to-day -day perspective, but I think the, consist the performance has been relatively consistent, uh, okay. just in general. Okay. Yeah. Did you uh, do any benchmarking of the uh, Oslo messaging uh, library against the native um, rabbit? Yeah, um, there is definitely some overhead there. Uh, yeah. I don't think we actually tested that in this um, specific uh, presentation, but like as a developer for Oslo messaging, there is like, uh, depending on what driver, you, even what driver you use, if it's Pika driver or Kombu driver, yes. there's different uh, overheads based on that. Uh, from what I know, or for, from what I remember, I, I believe the Pika driver for RabbitMQ performs a little bit better. Um, but yeah, there is some uh, overhead to Oslo messaging. There's been a few, there's been quite a bit of refactoring done and the recent cycles, so in the past few months. Um, right. But I don't have any hard numbers on whether that's improved anything or made things worse. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Do you think you could comment on possibly the benefits of separating out your RabbitMQ clusters to different services instead of using something just like Nova Cells, say, where everyone gets kind of their own, their own queue? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean. So if, if I understand it right, Nova, Nova cells get, everyone gets their own queue in a different cell, yeah. and that queue is dedicated to the cell, but um, in this model, it looks like you're splitting out in terms of, um, are, are you doing it by service, or like say, like Salometer all gets, everyone gets their own queue, and then like all the Nova services get their own different queue? Was that? It, it would have its own like rabbit and queue nodes. Like it would, the clusters themselves would still manage their own queues. Okay. Um, okay, yeah. yeah, cool, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, do you have any specific primary tuning for the RabbitMQ besides the separation of Nova and Neutron? Uh, not myself personally, uh, so I'm just representing the original author. Uh, I'm sure there's other techniques to doing it. Okay, yeah. so I was interested if you have any specific I, I can that I, I can pass yeah. that along and see if there's if you if there's any techniques that we use. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thanks for coming out, guys.